is going to be a little bit different from the other talks because I'm the only real scientist here today. And I am a real scientist. I'm a physics professor at WBUP. Um, where to start? As opposed to other people here who are, who are fortune telling and everything, uh, whether you believe in that or not, uh, there is some validity to it. Um, someone, mediums who are in contact with the dead. Um, as far as I'm concerned, as a, as a real scientist, some of them are absolutely correct in what they're doing. Um, we all have the ability to be psychics. We all have the ability to talk to the dead, or I really shouldn't say talk, sense the dead, in a sense. Although I've never seen a ghost, I, I know of no scientific reason why there are no such things as ghosts. Um, in fact, I could think of scientific reasons why there would be ghosts, but that's opposed to most scientists, because most scientists, you know, it has to be there, it has to be real for you to, to sense it or anything. But then I'm not a normal scientist, although I am a, a pure scientist, I would say. Now, scientists, if you follow scientific method, the first thing about scientific method as developed for the past 500 years has been you observe nature around you. Then you define quantities, then you measure those quantities, look for, look for a pattern in those quantities, develop a hypothesis to explain it, develop an experiment to verify the hypothesis, and then form a theory if you get positive results from the experiment, and then the law of nature. I mean, that's, that's a regimen. Now that, that's not an absolute thing because there are other scientists that work off on the edge of that. But in the study of parapsychology, which is a scientific study of paranormal phenomena, uh, they try and adhere to this. Now you have to go back to the very first step in the scientific method, and that is there are two ways to observe. You can observe the world around you logically uh, using reason, and scientists is built on logic and reason. Or you can do it intuitively. Those little things you know to be true, but you can't verify it anyway, that's intuition. Now, science is not against intuition. Although some people like to think it is. It's perfectly 100% reason and logic. That's bold. Science has its own intuitive belief. Scientists use their intuition. But a scientist will base his observation, his or her observation of the world on reason and logic. Things you can put in an equations and formulas, because math is extremely mathematics is extremely logical. And sort of push the intuition to the side. Whereas uh, the opposite in the other world, the other worldview, would be a mystic. Where a mystic try, and I'm not talking about a psychic, I'm talking about a mystic, a Buddhist mystic, a Taoist mystic. An Islamic mystic, um, someone who really studies the Kabbalah not because it's trendy, but because it's their life, the way they look at the world around them. And then the mystic uses intuition the same way that a scientist uses logic and reason. Try, tries to observe the world and explain the world around them using intuition. Now, you take intuition and reason together, and that gives you consciousness human consciousness. Now my field in physics is I do the physics of consciousness. And then an offshoot of that is the paranormal studies, parapsychology and paraphysics. So my deal is that I try to explain consciousness. I am interested in consciousness. Now remember there are two ways to observe the world. There are two ways to observe the world. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you to a method that's at over 100 years old that comes straight out of pure mathematics. Doesn't everybody cringe when I say that pure mathematics, yeah. on how to <laughs> enlighten yourself. This would be equivalent to a Buddhist or a Taoist enlightenment or a mystic enlightenment through mathematics and physics. Now we break down our you world. You have your work cut out for yourself. Pardon? You have your work cut out for yourself. <laughs> yeah, well it's already done if people would just do it. Um, and I can guarantee this will work. I can absolutely guarantee this work. But as far as I know, no one's been able to do it yet. That's the catch to it. It's not easy. Now, as a scientist, everything is reasonable in the world. 
I have to break everything down to reason and logic. I'm trying to explain phenomena, but I, as a scientist too, I know there are phenomena I can't explain. There's always something beyond what we can break down to reason. I think my guess is there probably always be something beyond what we can break down by reason. Now I can give you a good example. Good solid table, right? Does everybody believe that is a good material solid table? Yeah. Pedestal. Makes noise, I can balance around. I tell you, it's 99.9999% not there. That is 99.9999% empty space. You think that's solid. And I know, and I can verify, absolutely, that is not solid. <coughs> In fact, if I could take all the material content of this and put it together, the material content of that pedestal would be about as big as that top, which you can't see. Whoa. Thank you. You're just getting yourself on a film. You're going down oh. history. <laughs> no, actually this I'm showing this to my students in a physics class next week. They'll see this. See that's what I mean, I'm doing real science. Now if you take all the matter, the material, our consideration of this, it wouldn't be any bigger than that dot. Like the dot on a period, in a, in a book, in a sentence, printed. And if I could put that in my hand, it would be so dense, it would poke immediately, poke hold of my hand, and head for the center of the earth. You go right through everything because it's so dense. Because it's going through 99.999% it's going through empty matter. Well, why do we sense this as being solid when, in fact, we know it's not? Anybody? It's not solid matter. We sense it because I'm 99.9999% empty, empty space, but I can't put my hand through it. So the question becomes, then, why can't I put my hand through this? Why doesn't this fall through the floor? If everything's so much empty space, why doesn't this happen? Well, it's not filled, filled with matter. It's filled with something else that we talk about. And that something else is called field. F-I-E-L-D. Now, field is a very important thing. In, in science, as far as we know, there are only two things. Everything in the universe is made out of these two things. One is field, and the other one is matter, pure matter. Now, I stopped the store trying to find something like this to demonstrate to you exactly what a field is. We are, we are familiar with, actually, three types of field. Gravity field, electric field, and magnetic field. Those are the three. There are a couple other ones, but we don't really sense those on the everyday level. Now, you wonder if a field is real, like matter is real, these are little clips with magnets on it. You go on your, on your uh, refrigerator. I tried to buy a bunch of these. I couldn't find my stuff like two or three places on the way here trying to find simple little magnets. Couldn't find it. But if you take these magnet to magnet and hold it together, mm -hmm. and you can feel something pulling. Now there's nothing, it's just air between this. Matter is the air. But these are pulling. That pull is as real as matter is. That's the magnetic field. That's just move them together, see, see, see it pulls together, That's, the field is pulling them together. The field is every bit as real as matter is real. And every, as far as we know, everything in the universe is made out of this. Fields, now. Now, the field that I sense as the solidity of this table is not the magnetic field. It's the electric field, electricity and magnetism to go, go together, like two sides, same point. I can make electricity from magnetism and I can make magnetism from electricity. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very simple. Now what's holding this table together is between the protons, neutrons, and the electrons that make it up, it's filled with electrical field. So I can't push my hand through here. Why? Because the electrical field that is my hand, the solidity of my hand, is interacting with the solidity of the electric field that is the table. There you go. So it's not, I can't pass my hand through here, not because it's matter, but because it is field can't see field. Then why do you see this? Because electromagnetic waves that we call light bounce off of it and come back to my eyes. So what we sense is solid in this universe is not solid. 
Now, I'm trying to point out to you that what we see is not exactly what we get. <laughs> the universe is not exactly what we see reasonably. The universe is not exactly what we see logically. You have to make an intuitive leap. My eyes are telling me one thing, yet my scientific brain is telling me another about this. Now, as I said, there are two ways to view the universe. One is through intuition, and intuition is tied up with emotions and such, and then there's logic and reason. Now, I call this the Spock-McCoy syndrome. If you remember the old Star Trek, what was Spock? He tried to be absolutely logical and did everything by reason. McCoy was what? He was a scientist, but tried and did everything intuitively through emotion and intuition. Well, there's a third person, Kirk. Kirk is Kirk needed between Spock and McCoy. And what you don't know is when Gene Roddenberry wrote that series, he was talking about a single consciousness. So those are three facets of a single consciousness. And that's the way Gene Roddenberry told it afterwards. But he recognized, he recognized this. Now then, I can think of this intuitively, this table intuitively, or I can think of it logically. Now, if I get rid of my logic, I can leap in literally to another dimension, and my consciousness would go whammy, and I'd be up there with Buddha and Jesus and everybody else. So in a sense, I'm trying to show you how you can do that. But it's, again, no one's ever done it by this method. Yet I know it's an absolutely true method. And science, if you talk to another scientist and explain it to them, they'd agree with me. Now, I'm going to look at it logically. I'm going to look at this logically. In mathematics, you take a single point. A single point in mathematics has no dimension. It would be an inf what we call an infinitesimally small point, so it's no dimension. Then you take a line. A line is one-dimensional in mathematics. You take the line and the point together, the points being the corners, four lines, and you make a square. A square is a two-dimensional object. Everybody agree with that? Then we can put more points and lines together and make a three-dimensional object, a cube. But the problem with the cube is this isn't really a cube because this is just a two-dimensional drawing of a cube. Now, we can look at this logically. We can look at this logically, right? Now, that's, I'm, I'm attacking this way a ge uh, geometer or a scientist would attack it. I'm attacking it logically. At the same time, you have to realize intuitively. And I'll, you'll see your intuition working in a moment. Now, the point is one-dimensional. A line has two ends, and one-dimensional is square. Now, I can, I can um, count this up. One point or one corner, one edge. Four corners are points, four edges. So you increase the number of edges and everything as you go. But this, this, is, this is a corner, an edge, four corners, four edges, and one face. So we look at the cube. Now I can, I can construct a logical view of a cube, scientific, by counting the number of corners and faces. Remember, all the, all the edges are equal size, all the faces are equal size but it's three-dimensional. So I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight corners. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve edges. And one, two, three, four, five, six faces. That is a two-dimensional rendering of a three-dimensional object. This is a three-dimensional object, although it's sort of crooked. It's just masking tape and actually bamboo skewers from Walmart. This is a quickie job. I've got to make a better one someday. This is a cube. This is what it looks like three-dimensionally. And you see six faces, 12 edges, and eight corners. But that's three-dimensional. How do we think? Our consciousness thinks three-dimensionally. Now this, you can actually, can you actually see the three-dimensionality of this? In other words, you see the height, the width, and the depth, right? Look at this. This is a two-dimensional rendering of a three-dimensional object. Now, our minds, our consciousness works in three-dimensional space. This is a special cube. This is called a Necker cube, N-E-C-K-E-R. Nah, no, I can't write it, it's trouble. This board isn't very good. Necker, N-E-C-K-E-R. It's a Necker cube. Now look at that. 
because our minds think in three dimensions. This is a two-dimensional rendering of a 3D object. Our mind projects on this drawing three-dimensionality. In other words, if you look at it one way, it it's, goes back into the board. If you look at the other way, this is sticking out towards you. Now that is a trick our consciousness plays on us, our mind plays on us. Because we think three-dimensionally. Why do we th think three-dimensionally? Because when the light waves are bouncing off real objects, we get perception, we get depth perception. And so we see it width, height, and depth. Now, by the same token, can we think, can we consciously, can we intuitively think in a four-dimensional space? If we can come to a point where we intuitively think in a four-dimensional space, you'll be like Jesus, Buddha, all the rest of the enlightened people. Now, not all the, uh, not only religious people are enlightened, there are other people that are enlightened. This doesn't have to do with religion, although it usually takes religious interpretation. So it's not just the religious founders that were enlightened. I mean the next step up in consciousness, a higher level of consciousness. Uh, we consider more of that was uh, Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, was like that. And then Bodhisattvas and different people. So it's associated more with Far Eastern religions, but it is also a Western religion. Now, as I said, we can think of this logically by counting the number of corners, faces, and edges. That's a logical way of looking at it. When we look at this naked cube, either out or in, we're doing it intuitively. That's intuition that's doing that. See the difference between logic and intuition? Now, logically, I can build a four-dimensional cube by doing the points, the corners, and the edges. So I have a logical, mathematical view of a four-dimensional cube. I do five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, as many dimensional cubes as I want just by that. And I can draw a two-dimensional two rendering of a four-dimensional cube. And it will look like a cube inside the cube with the corner of the cube coming up and touching each of these corners. Now that is called, has a special name, it's called a tesseract. T-E-S-S-E-R-A-C-T, -S -S -E tesseract, and that is a four-dimensional cube. The concept, or the name at least, was developed by Charles Howard Hinton in the 1880s. And he's the one that developed the method of counting the corners, counting the edges, and counting the faces. Then what he tried to do, and there became a scientific philosophical argument about this in the 1880s and 90, 1890s, what he tried to do was build up different models of different geometrical figures like this, try and realize them into it intuitively so he could reach a higher level of consciousness. And he was a geometer. He was an English geometer, got his master's degrees from Oxford University, taught in Japan, taught it in Minnesota, he ended up at Princeton, and then at, uh, I think, Naval Research Lab in Washington in the first decade of the 20th century. So he, he was a scientist. He is famous for having invented a ball pitching machine so the baseball team could practice at Princeton University back in the 1890s. <laughs> I read a thing on it once in SSM. So he's a real person, <laughs> not somebody fake or anything. Now, the idea is to build a tesseract by counting up these things. Now I can draw a two-dimensional rendering of it, but I don't want to because I have a three-dimensional rendering that I made at home. That is a tesseract cube, a tesseract. Now as I said, it looks like, it looks like a cube inside a cube, but the thing is all the corners are connected. Now this is a three-dimensional equivalent of the two-dimensional Necker cube. I can take a logical point of view by counting up the corners. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Sixteen points for sixteen corners. Uh, let me see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Twelve on the bottom. And four more, twelve, twelve, twenty-four. No, I think it's twenty-four edges. And then the faces, I'd have 6, 6, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 faces on this. Or, yeah, 20 faces. So that's a logical. This is a logical construction. But I don't want to see this logically. That's the way a mathematician would look at it. I want to see this intuitively. In other words, I want to do 
the intuitive leap in my mind, where I see this four-dimensional figure in three-dimensional space, the same way I see this two-dimensional rendering of cube, or three-dimensional rendering of cube in two-dimensional space. As this pops in and out, this center cube actually has to come out and form a single solid. You have to do that intuitively, you can't do that logically. You know what, I guarantee if you do that, you'll see everything else in the universe different than you see it now, because your consciousness will have been elevated. Now, Hinton not only did... So is this then attached in any way, or...? Pardon? Now... If, this, if you think this cube out, would this be attached to the uh, main cube? Yeah, it would be a one single solid... It wouldn't be one inside the other, they'd all be edges around. Now, let, let's, let's try and analyze this scientifically. I'm gonna try, I, well, like I say, Hinton tried to do it for 30 years, not just with the Tesseract, but he did all, you know, like, pen, he used pentagon figures, like uh, geodesic figures with pentagons and hexagons and all these other shapes. Pyramids, basically a, a pyramid is a three-dimensional solid. And he'd do the uh, four-dimensional equivalent pyramid. He tried to do it with all of them, built models like this. But about after 20 or 30 years of trying, he said, fine, he finally had to admit he couldn't do it. That's why he say, I don't know that anyone has ever do it. Yet I know, and I think most scientists would agree, that if you could understand that intuitively, you would reach a whole new level of consciousness, and your whole world would change around. But I don't know if anyone has ever done it. Now, look at it logically. As I said, the faces are all equal size. They don't look equal size in the drawing, do they? No. Are the edges all equal size in the drawing? No, they're not equal length in the drawing. But because we see this two-dimensional as a three-dimensional thing, we think of them as equal. Now, you have to be able to do the same thing with this. If you can, if you can think of this four-dimensionally, this three-dimensional rendering of four-dimensional figure, if you can think of this using a four-dimensional part of your consciousness, which is extremely hard. Why is it hard? Because you've had, however old you are, you have had your whole life seeing, observing everything three-dimensionally. You literally have to break your life down and change your whole life to do it. That's why I say this, this would be an enlightening type thing. You would reach a higher state of consciousness. Everything you're familiar with, and it's not just your sight, it's also touch and your other senses. All five of your normal senses, all five of your normal senses are based on the three-dimensionality of space. So you've been you've been trained you've been brainwashed in that way. You in a sense have to rebrain or clean your brain out or rebrainwash or something to be able to think four dimensionally. But in order to do that, now we see this since we're looking at three three dimensionally, we see these edges as one size, we see these edges on the inner square as another size, another length, and we see this as a shorter length. In order to four dimensionally view this three dimensional rendering, all those would have to be the same length. All the faces, and then see, we see this face as like a trunk, what would be called a truncated pyramid. It's not. That is actually a square. If we think of this four dimensionally, all the edges will become the same length. There won't be anything inside anything because this will all be outer, and all these would be the same size faces and all the same size edges. Now, can't do it with this because we're looking at it logically and through a reasoning part of our, of our brain, of our mind, of our consciousness. You'd be better if you, if you have a picture of this in your mind. And unfortunately, the little, the little balls, that distract you from doing it. You have to have a perfect figure. But I didn't have a way easily to build one like that. The balls are good to look at logically because it makes things easy to count. But you have to see, see this for what it is. A cube inside a cube. And better even to think of it sort of contemplate on it, meditate on it, like an own, like a meditation type thing, to the point where your consciousness can actually, in a sense, sense this four-dimensionally instead of three-dimensionally, and then look at it again in our three-dimensional world and see what happens to it. That's how I would suggest doing this. But I, I absolutely guarantee your consciousness will go through the roof. Because if I can see four-dimensionally, I'll walk through the wall. 
Because if I can start to see things three-dimensionally, I'll know the difference between the electrical field and the magnetic fields, and the slowly of this, and I'll be able to walk through it. Because there are little rules in higher dimensional space. If this is a cage, and I'm inside it, I can't get out of it, can I? No doors, no locks or anything, I can't get out of it. Yet if there's another higher dimensional space, I can step into the higher dimension and be on the outside without ever going through the walls. Scientific fact, mathematical fact. So I can literally go through, you would see me as going through that wall, but I'd actually be going into the higher dimension and going around that wall. But you'd see me as going through that wall. If I could just think, if my consciousness would be able to sense the universe in four dimensions instead of three. So I do everything that they say is paranormal. But for me, what you call paranormal would be what? What we call paranormal is absolutely normal in a four-dimensional space. It's absolutely normal in a four-dimensional space. Now, funny as it may be, funny as it may be, from a historical point of view, in 1905, Einstein made time the fourth dimension. And so they stopped trying to do things like this because they thought time was the fourth dimension. But 1921, another scientist, mathematician, by the name of Kaluza came along, and he developed a five-dimensional theory, a four-dimensional space with, a, with time as your fifth dimension. And he was able to unify physics. Now, what's really funny is he did it in 1921, yet they're still trying to do it because they didn't believe he was right. And today they talk about 10 and 11-dimensional space-times, which is what bull. His name? Pardon? What was his name? Kaluza, Theodore Kaluza, K-A-L-U-Z-A. And basically, my, my, my scientific theories are extensions of Einstein's and Kaluza's work, where I explain what is actually happening in the paranormal and everything. Now, is there some justification for this? Could this possibly be real? Well, have you heard of Raymond Moody before? Yeah. Raymond Moody is, he's not the first one to write about them, but he's the one who called them MDEs, near-death experiences. Mm -hmm. And the very first book he wrote, I think in 1973 or so, um, he has an account from one woman who had had a near-death experience and come back. And basically she is describing where she was at during that near-death experience. And she said, well, sort of, and this is a book, this isn't a quote, I don't remember exact quote in Moody's book, but it's something to this effect. I, I come back here and the geometry that they taught me in school here is wrong. It's different from the geometry there. Why? Because this is a three-dimensional geometry, that's a four-dimensional geometry. Do you want to know where we are when we, when we die? We're in that fifth dimension of space-time. Our material bodies here, that part of us that dies, is four-dimensional, three-dimensional space with time. Or you can think of it as three-dimensional space with a separate time. It's the fourth-dimensional space or the fifth-dimensional space-time. They're the same thing, just looking at it from different perspectives. But the mathematics and the science is already there. Well, that's where we are when we die. We are all extended in this higher dimension, this higher dimension right now. But it's not a material extension. Because what is it then? It's steel. It's electromagnetic field. It's gravitational field. It's the field that is extended. And that we can't sense because we're three-dimensional space, one-dimensional time. So we don't we can sense that, that extra dimension. And that extra dimension, when our material body dies, what's left of us, our mind and consciousness, continues to exist in that extra dimension, but without the materiality of this four-dimensional space-time. So what might we be able to do if we can all of a sudden look at this and see this more dimensionally, where all the faces are the same size and same shape, all the edges are the same length. Due to this, the same thing we do with the neck of cube where it comes in and out like that. See this intuitively instead of logically. Well, I think we'd be mediums. We'd be great psychics. Has no one ever come like back who has seen it? Pardon? Has no one ever come back who has seen it? Well, for one thing, you wouldn't see in this higher dimension. You wouldn't have eyes anymore. You would be in this higher dimension. You would be 
your consciousness and your mind. Most people with these near-death experiences, they have been there. Yeah, the so near-death experience people. So and if they come back, anyone ever seen anything like this? Um, I don't know. I've never, I've never had the grant money or anything to go around and use something like this to test people who've had near-death experience. I, that's a good experiment that I could do. Go test them. How would someone who's had a very profound near-death experience? How would they view this? Could do they think a little bit four-dimensional? But then, as soon as they come back, they're stuck in our three-dimensional space and go back to the old habits. Mm -hmm. They sort of have to have a foot there and a foot here in order to. <coughs> census, but it's, it's a possible experiment to do in the future. But nobody's going to give me grant money, so. Um, at this point, I have, I, I've developed a scientific theory based on Einstein's work that explains paranormal and everything. So I, I go and do presentations actually at scientific conferences. I'll be going in April to Tucson, Arizona to the big international conference on consciousness. And I'll make a proposal to do a presentation, which I've already done like five times out in Tucson. And I'll go and tell them basically the same thing I'm telling you right here now, only I'll have a group of 75 international scientists listening to me. Psychologists, physicists, mathematicians, chemists, and they'll all be listening to me. And I'll tell them exactly the same thing I'm saying to you. I'll just put it in slightly different scientific terms for them. But if you can do this, I can guarantee you will be an enlightened individual at the level of Buddha. I just don't think Buddha and the others, I don't think they did it that way. They did it another way. But what happens? If you try and do it this way, even if you don't succeed, and you try and do it their way, this is going to get you 40% there, their way, you only have to do the other 60% for enlightenment. Any questions? Yeah, Jeff. You don't know what to ask, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's really a utopia for me. Yeah, and what I'm telling you is something, if you sit down, now if you if you say, if you go and talk to a scientist or mathematician, tell them, just tell them about this conference. What I've just said to you, they go, you know, pull. But if I, if I sit down and talk to them, because they're thinking only with their reasoning logic minds, yet if I put them in front of me, that they, and explain it the way I just did to you, they go, yay! Because I put it in their terminology. And there's nothing, there's nothing in science that can refute what I've just told you. There's absolutely nothing in science or mathematics that can in any way refute or deny what I've told you. But you have to, you have to look at the difference. You have to look at the world reasonably and logically the way a scientist does. At the same time, you have to look at it intuitively the way the mystic does. Because those are two different parts of a single consciousness. And you have to be able to see the world around you using your whole consciousness. Your whole mind, not just one part of it. Or you end up with some, like some scientists that have their foot in their mouth most of the time. And I tell them that too. I don't hold it back. That's why I'm stuck in WBUP and not at Princeton or someplace like that. Still no questions? I remember seeing <coughs> shapes like that with soap bubbles. They had shapes within them. Mm -hmm. And that created in, the, in that form in bubbles. Did you like spin out or anything? No. <laughs> well, what, what would happen if, if you start thinking of things four-dimensionally? It, it can come in many different ways. This is just one method. This is just one method. As I said, um, you go and you, you go over to India and sit with a guru or something. Om Mani Padme Om, Om Mani Padme Om. And it's the same thing. You're just concentrating. You're just becoming one with that little slogan. Well, that's a verbal slogan. This is a visual slogan. What I'm saying is this can be used the same way that that could be used. And you'd see the world differently. Be used anyway. Maybe you'd see this in soap bubbles. Historically, some of the some of the leaders that have been enlightened were enlightened naturally. They weren't meditating on a chant, they weren't meditating on the tesseract. They just bam, became enlightened. Um, probably one of the more documented ones was um, a gentleman by a young boy by the name Hua Lian, who is naturally enlightened. 
and he came, went on to be the sixth patriarch of um, Chan Buddhism because he is naturally enlightened. And some people, maybe he's living in soap bubbles. Maybe that's your, you know, if your if your consciousness can can sense that in, in a special way, that might be your road to enlightenment. Chan Buddhism, when it moved to moved to Japan became Zen Buddhism, so you know it better as Zen Buddhism, so he's founder of Zen Buddhism. I don't know, I'm just offering you another way to get there, another road to take. You, you do different methods, you get there. And th this isn't about, this isn't about Tarot, this isn't about pyramids. Um, my view on all of those things is, those are just different symbols, Tarot, rune stones, all the different figures are just different symbols. When it comes down to it, it's just your individual consciousness and your own mind, how they interpret that. And friends of mine who do these things admit to me on the slide, yes, that's what it is. It's the individual consciousness and the individual mind, not the symbols you use to get there. No questions? Anything still too hot in here? <laughs> Well, I hope I've, I hope I've helped some of you, um, enlighten you in a small way. All these little uh, wheels are still turning. This is completely new to me, so. Oh, well, it, it's new to you, but yeah. science is known about it, like I say, for a while. This is, there's a big scientific argument in the 1880s and 1890s. You go to uh, Science Magazine and the different scientific journals, and you will see where they're arguing. Is it possible to, re they use the word realize, I'd say cognize, but they use the word realize. Is the realization of a four-dimensional space possible? And so they have these, these debates and everything on the possibility of it. So, I mean, this, but then in 1905, after Einstein came along and said time is the fourth dimension, they backed off. They didn't need to think about it anymore. They didn't need to know what a fourth-dimensional space was because time was a fourth dimension. So it was sort of lost after after the beginning of the 1900s. All this was lost. But now they're starting to think about it again. Well, if you, 1920, the other one was with the five dimensions. So then they should have started again. But see, you can't get to the five dimension until you're able to think in four dimensions. But if you get, what happens if you get in that fifth dimension? If It'd be like uh, the, the floor, the carpet on the floor is the four dimensional space time. And you're on fifth dimension out here. What could you see? Your total past, your total present, and your total future. Because you'd be outside of time, also. Now, during near-death experience, what is one of the first things a person experiences? Pardon? The life review. The life review. Okay, they're just viewing their four-dimensional space-time life from a five-dimensional point of view. They don't have a future, so they don't see their future life. They only see their past life. That's it. And how do they see it? They see their whole life, the past life review, in a moment, like that. Well, they have to be outside of time to do that. See, my, my, my ideas are fully supported by the literature and the observations of other people. Well, fifth dimension. Uh, and fifth dimension, you experience not only your life on the earth, but your universal life. I don't know why not. I would think you'd experience everything because it's your pure consciousness. And if there's such a thing as reincarnation, which I think there's, there is, there is, there is evidence right now, scientific evidence that supports the reality of reincarnation. So once you're in your consciousness, yes, you should see all your past lives also. I presume when you're better, even your future lives. lives. Pardon? In between lives. Yeah. I've read yeah. about experiences outside the earth plane. Mm -hmm. I presume that that would include. Well, the when you start talking about the plane, right now I'm only talking about what would be this plane. The earth okay. plane would be our, our four dimensional universe. I personally believe there are probably an infinite number of dimensions. Mm -hmm. And just like we're a five dimensional space time for our universe that within that infinity of dimensions, there may be other pockets. In fact, there may be eight dimensional universes elsewhere within that infinity of dimensions. We're just like a little pocket inside that. There's no reason to suspect that. But I really can't talk about those other 
what you call planes of existence that I call other other parts of the uh, universe within that infinite dimensional space. I can't speak of those. I, I don't have any evidence or experience of those. But as a scientist, I can't say they don't exist because there's nothing in science that says it's impossible. I, I'm presuming that if, you, if you're able to see your, your entire life experience, mm -hmm. that includes those what is known as the Akashic record. Well, I think I think the Akashic Record is just a religious name for the same thing that I'm talking about. That's used, that's trying to use that is a purely intuitive, purely intuitive what I'm trying to talk about logically and intuitively together. So I think that's just a name someone else gave it a long time ago in Buddhism and Hinduism. Because they did, they didn't ha they didn't have the they didn't have the geometric scientific language to explain it, so they gave it a religious connotation and called it the Akashic or the Akashic records. Yeah, I think that's what it is. Others? <coughs> Imagine my time's about up. Is anybody timing me? Can't go on for another two hours. No <laughs> way. You can go on. I don't know how much I will understand. Well, about I'll it. answer questions as long as you want. <laughs> See, I don't want you to understand. I just want you to know the possibility, because it's my belief that you don't understand it logically. But I'm not only talking to the logic and reason in your mind. I'm talking to the intuition in your mind. So, subconsciously, consciously, you don't understand what I'm talking about. You just got a little nitpicking feeling up here. It's getting the gears working. But I'm talking to you subconsciously. I'm talking directly. I'm speaking directly to your consciousness. And just doing that, I'm helping you. <coughs> because if you ever make it there, you're going to see that I was right. Within my limited explanation of it, I was right. There's a whole lot more to it. So, I mean, I can't, I can't put the whole universe down into a 45 minute talk. Not that I would even be capable of doing that, but I can at least give you, you would see that the rough outline of what I'm talking about is correct. So, you do understand it. You, you, everyone has intuition. Everyone has intuition can sense what I'm saying, even if you don't understand it. Didn't you know? We're learning machines. We are learning machines. If you want to know what our purpose is in the universe, it is to learn, to discover. That is our purpose. Everyone, what is the purpose of a human being? I'm sorry, it is to learn. We start learning from before we're born. We're already sensing and learning. Did anyone see last week on the, um, the, uh, oh, the, um, the ultrasonic sound method for looking at babies in the womb is getting so exact, you know, they can actually almost take perfect pictures of babies using ultrasonics now. And they had a picture on the news last, a week to 10 days ago, something they didn't even think possible. They have a picture of a baby inside the womb opening its eyes. They did not know that was possible. The, the picture was just and you can tell it's in the womb, it almost looked like a real picture, but that's how good the ultrasonics has gotten now. So we're already, already in the womb. We're already learning. So if you ladies start get pregnant, you want to talk to your kid. Say nice things to him. Play Bach and Beethoven to him. <laughs> so, um, see, it's a, you, we, you are living, we're all living in probably and it goes more for the young people. We're living in a terrible time for the world with overpopulation and pollution and everything. Yet at the same time, one of the mysteries of life is we're also living in one of the most interesting times in human history because knowledge and everything is exploding. We're learning so much so fast we can't keep up with it. And it's sort of a yin-yang type thing. The bad stuff comes with the good stuff, I think. Mm -hmm which is why we have all these other problems on the earth right now. Okay? Fini? Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you.